you, Hedy, for that um, generous remark. And I really do feel I'm a, I'm the lucky one. I'm the lucky one to um, have the privilege, privilege to study this music. And this is only my fourth time actually visiting Vancouver. So Vancouver is very special to me, uh, and you will see why. So in 2005, I was browsing through the UBC Chang collection online. And I stumbled onto this picture. And the feeling I can't quite explain to you, but I can only say I feel she's waiting for me there all this time. Because in that particular collection that has this picture, it was anonymous, just like nothing was you know, prescribed to her. But I know she's waiting for me because I know her. And she, um, I've never seen a picture like her, uh, like this, of her. But I know of her. I know her performance. I know where she's been to in North America. I follow her steps in trying to figure out what you know she's done. And so, that's her, the, the, the one on the uh, right hand, uh, the second from the right, that's her. She's singing in this uh, performance, uh, and we don't quite know what this was, but you can tell from the performance and the wardrobe that it was substantial. And she's here. She's the second from the left, and this is a famous uh, opera. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's about Pan Jinlian, so she's uh, playing these... Uh, a uh, woman who's been led away because uh, suspected that she killed her husband. And she's also here. She's there in this kind of warrior play, right? And these were um, all pictures of stage performances from San Francisco in 1920s. And as you can see, I saw her on stage in all sorts of pictures, but I never saw one that's as beautiful as the one that she had, like that, you know, portrait. And it was an amazing moment for me to see her in her, uh, true, her, her true self. And another thing that's very important for that picture for me is that I know when some collection would have a picture like her, a picture like that of her, it means that the community treasured her. Right? So she's not only someone on stage, you know, performing, but She's someone who was adored by the community. And that's why that particular performance, uh, particular picture was really stunning to me. And I really just really love that. And therefore I know that Vancouver is the place where I would trace her. Because um, I have this strong feeling that when she uh, was in San Francisco and performing in those, you know, in those beautiful stage, she was there um, after she's been somewhere else first. And that Vancouver picture was the place that she began. So that's her name. Her name is Guan Ling. And you can see on this uh, really phenomenal picture that she was actually uh, truly adored. On the very top, you can see that this is a um, uh, kind of decoration that has actually her name uh, encircled uh, in two, uh, two things. And then in the middle, that's her. And that's whole range of uh, performers uh, showing her in this particular role. And that was the troupe that's called um, uh, Le Wan Nian that Emily had uh, shown us about. And this was a picture from 1922. It was a very important picture. And you can imagine the community had such respect not only for her, but also for the troupe that was, you know, uh, so grand, right? And I must say, Vancouver should, Chinese community, uh, it should be very proud to have this picture because I've never encountered anything like this in my research. This is just gorgeous and it's in Chang collection. So from this picture, can you already tell there was a lively Chinese theaters in 1920s, right? Uh, it, there's a whole group of people who perform at the top, most professional level, and there's a group of people who, you know, bring them all the way uh, across from San Francisco, uh, across from China to perform in North America. And in Vancouver, they were given such, you know, kind of, of um, um, 
adoration and, and so on and so forth. So this really just impress, uh, I think, anyone. If you look at the top, you can see these are all uh, banners that praises the troop and that have great significance. It was an important community event. So this is a theater that the uh, that was actually uh, the location where the uh, the troupe was performing, and it's uh, formerly called the Imperial Theater. And this actually was the exact picture of 1921. So I imagine they must have transformed this theater into a Chinese theater, and we have proof of that. Um, so. Before I move on to talk more about that, I want to just show you that there's a lot of performances like this um, that were pictured. And as we know, picture in 1920 was very difficult. So they took a lot of time to stage everybody and then to have the exposure and to you know show that. So there's a lot of community support for the theater and a lot of people who you know, spend a lot of effort to make this exciting night after night. That is to say, they don't just repeat a repertoire and play for three days. No, they don't do anything like that. They put on one of these, and then they put on another one like this. And there's, as you can see, I can, you can probably see there's an airplane at the top, right? And there's, at the bottom, there's um, uh, people who are, I guess, you know, uh, taking different stands, right? Uh, at that time, Vancouver was very politically, uh, uh, the community was very politically kind of um, uh, in, in contradiction. Uh, they, they have different camps, um, so on and so forth. Okay, I want to show you this picture as well, because I've been talking about this in the past two days, in that they didn't just you know, portray the traditional stuff. They also have fancy stuff. They were influenced by uh, Hollywood and also the pictures that were part of um, the, the kind of things they want to uh, experiment, right? So this is a combination of these uh, traditional people um, in the Ming Dynasty kind of order as well as this. It's just fascinating. So with that introduction, I think you can see where I'm coming from. I'm here to share with you the genealogy and the story of Chinese theaters in North America. And that 1920s was an exciting moment, and I'll tell you why. Um, but uh, I want to just lay out uh, the various areas in which that Chinese opera theater was uh, you know, uh, an important force of the culture in the Chinese community. The first is the Chinese theaters from 1852 to around 1950s. These, during this time, they're, they're what I call the professional theater in that they perform every night, and if they have the means, they will publish playbills every night, and so on and so forth. And that's the period in which they really perform really, really uh, sustained uh, sustain theaters that you know, sit thousands and thousands of people. And the second time uh, is the situation where they actually are featured in world fairs, right? So in various different world fairs, especially one, the Columbia Exposition in uh, Chicago, it was very famous in how um, Chinese theater was you know, important part of it. And the next one is uh, Mei Lan Fang, who's actually a Peking opera performer, what we have talked about so far, a Cantonese opera. But Mei Lan Fang was actually Peking opera performers, and this is one of the most high-profile performance of, um, of, of, of uh, I should say, Chinese actor in, on Broadway, right? So uh, basically, he conquered uh, Broadway and then went to also San Francisco and then went to uh, LA and received uh, uh, honorary degree. So the next one I want to say is that after 1950s, there are actually no professional theaters anymore. Why? Because there are a lot of other entertainment, right? However, I want to make the claim that Cantonese opera in particular still was very, very influential in the Chinese community. Why? Because they come in as films. I've interviewed many people who grew up in Chinatown, uh, you know, in the 50s, and that's what they do. They go to theater and then they watch these Cantonese opera films. So those are very important. And another way of 
continue this uh, company's opera performance is actually in the opera club. So people have, you know, amateur who like to sing and then they perform periodically and they also host uh, professional troops uh, to come to the United States to perform. And the last one, as um, Gloria has mentioned, Chinese Music Association is very important as well because the instrument, uh, instrumental music is closely related to company's opera. In fact, the a company musician for the company's opera were typically leaders of this Chinese ensemble, uh, and they were actually uh, became they actually became more and more important as time went on. Okay, so these I lay out for you the various different uh, influences of uh, the that constitute this 170 years. Today, however, I'm going to focus on the first one because I have a lot of story to tell there. And with some time we do have at the end, I'll also show you some companies' opera films. So at the beginning, as you know, in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1852, there is this you know, big uh, group of uh, Chinese immigrants come to North America. And as you can see at that time, uh, from, ta from China to uh, San Francisco or to uh, the uh, British Columbia is a lot closer than it is from you know, uh, New York going around the, the south to come up here. And therefore, uh, companies' um, uh, migration become very, very uh, lively because they became the main source of a lot of materials that California needed for build its nation. It's a lot cheaper to get it across the Trans-Pacific than you know, going the other way. So these are the places where the, the companies um, came, and they were very, um, very interestingly situated in, in this area because they are the very good, um, experienced people who know how to deal with foreigners, and they also have the means, in some ways, to gather the, uh, enough, you know, money to buy tickets to send people overseas. Uh, so these were the Trans-Pacific net, uh, network that was uh, allowing people to go across uh, the Pacific and become, become part of the California community. And as soon as the uh, you know, community started to establish, immediately the Chinese troop came. And here is the first troop that we have uh, knowledge about, and it's called Hong Fu Tang in Chinese. But in English, it has a lot of different ways of spelling this. And for those of you who um, might be able to read this in some detail, you will see that it's a standard repertoire that's performed in the uh, you know company's opera kind of um, uh, the the kind of opera you perform on the first day of you premiere in a place. These are the typical performances, typical opera. One of them is called the uh, Liu Guo Feng Xiang, right? And they have a lot of uh, important um, roles and uh, costumes uh, that they present themselves in the most glorious way ever possible. Another important thing to remember about this, uh, as you probably can't quite tell, is that this whole troop has 123 people. So to bring a troop of 123 members, it takes a lot of money. In fact, they almost, you know, occupy the whole troop, whole, whole vessel that bring them over. Um, the whole vessel brings something like 156 people, and 123 of them were the performers. And many people don't know of these three people, okay? Uh, but they tell us a lot about these companies of our troop. And that is because, um, they were actually important people. They were not uh, just anybody. They were leaders. They were trained in the missionary school. They're bilingual. And so a lot of these people, especially Norman Asin, came um, as early as uh, uh, 1850 and was very high profile in engaging with the community. They attend, they organize all sorts of parades uh, to celebrate, for example, Washington's uh, birthday, or to celebrate July 4th. So 
So we have records of uh, Norman R. Singh being one of the Chinese leaders that participated in those important events. And this second one is uh, a graduate from Morrison School, and he spent some time in the United States and then went back to China and become one of the most powerful uh, kind of uh, uh, people who engage with various different kind of trades and situations. And there were also people, these leaders who brought Chinese opera troop over, were also the people who stand up to afford the community to the uh, mainstream uh, kind of you know uh, political situation. So when anti-Chinese sentiment start to rise and they start to have you know different ways of uh, just kind of targeting Chinese immigrants and so on and so forth. These are the people who spoke up to the government at time and say, you cannot do this to us. This doesn't go along with your uh, funding uh, principle of the United States and so on and so forth. So they were powerful people. So I think it's really important for us to remember perhaps that at that time, the powerful people in the Chinese community want to have Chinese theater in North America, because it's a way to help them expand their influence, to show the culture, right, and to impress, indeed, of the, the people of, who are probably, you know, have much less uh, civilization than Chinese, right? They're proud. So for a whole week, that Hong Fu Tang uh, troupe performed, and they put on advertise every single day in the newspaper. And it, as we have the record now, they uh, they play different things every night. And not only in California that they know about this, New York also reported about, hey, there's a Chinese troupe in San Francisco, right? So they were all kind of paying attention to the Chinese troops actually in North America. That was a big event for everybody. However, it's hard for us to study these Chinese theaters. Why? Because their names are very, very different. Depends on who's writing the reports, right? So these are the different spelling of that particular troop that I can find in the newspaper. I'm sure this is not all. Uh, so for anyone who wants to do this study, you actually really have to dig and have to you know, have the imagination to think how to do it. Um, but this just gives you a kind of funny way of showing how they can be all different. Another important point I always like to bring people to think about is that at a time in San Francisco, there's no, almost no opera production. Imagine, it was expensive for them to bring opera production, right? So all they have, for the most part, were performance of one singer, two or three, right? Uh, or two or three kind of people for English drama. It was nothing huge. So Tang, uh, Hong Fu Tang began his performance in San Francisco in 1852. And that was only a year and a half after the first fully produced European opera uh, that was performed in San Francisco. And in fact, 1882 was a year that there was not a single European opera produced in San Francisco. And so this company's opera troops that has 123 people, imagine, 123 people on stage and then the instruments, right? They have such a showing and the theater space, we were just talking to another historian that tell us it's actually 2,000 seats, right? So it was a big splash and it was really significant event. Okay, so they didn't stay in uh, San Francisco. They were attracted by um, a contract uh, by a uh, manager and who took them across the south and on the boat, uh, on the, one of the uh, sh uh, ship, and then go to uh, San uh, I'm sorry, New York to perform. And they perform at this place that's called um, Needle and Garden, right? Um, so unfortunately, that was not a good move for them because the person who was the manager that brought them over was uh, American and then cheated them and then took their money or took whatever the money and then ran. So uh, it was not a successful event. However, it doesn't stop, you know, uh, the, uh, the opera to continue to exist in America. And that's because there's demand. 
So at that time, you know, the mining country has a lot of Chinese who were, you know, not only digging gold, but also, you know, building the agricultural development and also do the forest kind of work and doing a lot of fishing kind of so on and so forth. So these are all the people, these are all the places that I shown here that have indication of uh, ever hosted Chinese theaters. So Chinese theaters were built actually in these places. And sometimes they were performing in the theater of um, uh, already existed. But if the place doesn't have a theater, no problem, they build one. And that's very, you know, lively and uh, important. And these are the, all the cities, uh, I'm sorry, all the towns uh, in the inner part of, of California, Northern California, they call them mother load, right? That actually had Chinese theaters present. And it's, you, can sh you can see that it's numerous and it was very interesting uh, way of thinking about. Because I say it's very interesting what you think about because in China they perform that way a lot. They perform along the you know uh, uh, the river to the different villages. So for them to come and perform that way in North America, it was nothing new really. So at the same time, when they are performing in this inner inner city and the interior of California, they also appear on in on a, continue to appear on different stages in San Francisco. And this is one of the ones. Uh, as you can see, this is the McGuire Theater that was very famous around that time. And they have like a feature like this. And then there's another one at Metropolitan Theater. And it also has, you know, troops that perform a very, in a very prominent way. These are not long performances, actually. I suspect, I suspect that they actually perform in uh, Chinese community regularly. And then this, you know, San Francisco theater also want their presence, so they would contract them to perform in these larger audiences, uh, and so larger space for the uh, American audience, right? So they kind of going back and forth. So as you can see, that's this is what I'm kind of what I'm talking about. 1867 was still the time when we don't have one Chinese theater devoted to only you know, uh, Cantonese opera. But we do have the city directory, a mentioning of two Chinese theaters in two particular locations, okay? And so it goes to show that in addition to the mining towns, in addition to the San Francisco large theaters, they also have different locations that continue to perform. We don't know a lot about them because we, they don't show up in newspapers. However, in 1869, something big happened, and that is the completion of transnational uh, railroad, right? Trans, trans, I'm sorry, transcontinental railroad. And after this railroad was completed, it was not actually really complete because it only go as far as um, Sacramento. But at least there's a way for people from the east to take the train and go all the way, and then basically overcome all those difficult lands of Rocky Mountain and can arrive at Sacramento. And that means they have a way to see what's happening in California, which was mystery for the rest of the country. And so on, after that, then they start to see that Chinese theaters were really important part of the um, uh, San Francisco community. So the first Chinese theater that was built exclusively for uh, Cantonese opera was uh, built in 18. 68. And so as soon as the theater, uh, as soon as the railroad is built, the theater show up in the magazine, uh, in this one with wood engraving. And as you can imagine, we have very important uh, Chinese uh, community leaders, and they were very engaged in making more Chinese theaters. So um, the first year of 1868, you don't really need to remember this, 1868, and then 1874, they built the second one. And then they built the third one. But the third one is very important. Why? Because the third one was right after a big riot that actually says, China, Chinese must go. 
is their biggest slogan. They really try to kick Chinese out. This event happened in July. The third theater opened in October. So it didn't stop them. It didn't stop them from being, um, you know, lively and enjoy the cultural production. And I want to just also show who built the third theater. They were the people who built actually this uh, designed the San Francisco City Hall in 1871. They were the people who built, uh, you know, mansion for Charles Quaker, one of the you know uh, magnet of, of of the railroad construction. So Chinese community leaders recruited the top architect to build their uh, theater. And we don't really have a lot of you know, pictures surviving from that time, fortunately. And this is one of the ones that shows this fourth theater that was built in 1879. And this is the inside, you can see the decoration, you can see the name, Chinese name is here, English name is here, and these are special design and so on and so forth. They have box seat and so on and so forth. Lively, very lively performances. And you can also see the performers depicted in some of the magazines. And this is a real uh, oil painting uh, by a, an artist whose name is Theodore Wards. And he and another painter uh, whose name is um, Cox, something Cox, uh, paint beautiful pictures of uh, Chinese performers. And they also appear in various different kind of magazines. So let's come back to Canada. So at the same time that those performances were, you know, lively in San Francisco, in Canada it was just as lively, actually, no less lively, I must say. And you can say that it is actually uh, in 1882 the newspaper report of this particular theater is also built uh, in specifically for Chinese. Uh, performances, right? And not only that, you also see that 1885, there's more mentioning in newspaper about the Chinese theaters and their importance. And we also, from the map, can tell that they actually do exist. So I have here marked for you A and B. These are in Victoria, and they're, these A and B are two Chinese theaters. And you can see um, that they're uh, very lively. So 1913 uh, is the time that uh, this map was made. And this is the compound, basically, of the famous uh, Ixang. And in his compound, he, uh, he was, as you know, the, one of the most famous uh, uh, Canadian Chinese who, um, who developed such a, a wealth and influence, and he had a Chinese theater built inside his community. And from his company, later in the 1870s, we uncover uh, some of the materials. These are powder, these are, you know, uh, uh, rouge for uh, performances, and so on and so forth. But that is not all. In 1917, we also have pictures of performers in Peru. And these are also from the exams. You can tell that they are active. Uh, so the Chinese opera uh, or company's opera at that time was very extremely lively. And this is a, a play deal that's actually for uh, Vancouver. Uh, so we talk about Victoria, we talk about Lima, we talk about San Francisco. Now we are in Vancouver. Vancouver in the 1910s had three theaters, and this is one of them. It has, this is the playbill they print, and there was um, a series of them uh, that you can find in archive. And uh, we also find that they have a lot of uh, the uh, business paper. You can see that they're having a lot of people who show up. Here's one little rep, uh, report that I share with people about how many tickets were sold. My view, this is one of the three theaters, okay? And this evening, you can tell that they sold 1,027 tickets. And that was probably to the uh, capacity. And this is the one evening that they didn't do so well. 
but not doing so well means 536 ticket, right? So imagine it's almost like you know a a important community space that people come and just enjoy themselves. Okay, so this is again is um, the next development. So we were talking about 1810s. I'm sorry, 1910s, and then 1920s is this big troop that happened. And this is from Emily's newspaper. It is the Loanian's very first newspaper advertisement. It's huge. It takes a whole, whole you know, row like this. And then you can see the performers. One of the performers, uh, Mai Sulan, uh, she was appearing in the middle uh, as part of that group. And she also was featured in the Toronto Daily uh, Star. This just gives an idea of how lively the community had enjoyed the Cantonese opera in a variety of uh, situations, including both the, um, the, the, uh, the, the 1910s situation, which they have three theaters, and the 1921 situation where they take up one of the main theater of the mainstream uh, society and then make it their own. Right? So they expand outside of Chinese community and still do that. And then they also play an important role in creating a renaissance or a gold, second gold era of Cantonese opera in North America. Why? Because in the United States, it was impossible to have theaters. The Chinese exclusion killed the pipeline of uh, actors, and the fire and earthquake killed everything. So it was up to the Canadian to bring the theater down to them. And at that time, they not only go to uh, San Francisco, they also go to Lima and goes to show that it was such a lively uh, network. And this is why I'm showing you here. This is Hong Kong that comes over through Honolulu and then going to North America to have a whole network of performers. And then the um, Canada play yet another important role. Guess what they did? They not only have theater in Vancouver, but also they sent people to have theater in Honolulu, right? So this is a company called Hyo King, uh, Kyo, Kyo Hing, uh company. They send people and uh, engage a whole troupe to perform. This is one of the play field there, and this is the kind of performances they, they did. So I want to play for you a little bit of uh, my favorite song from that time, and this is from the uh, Li Xiefang. <laughs> I really love her voice and she also I made a claim in an article was responsible in elevating the role of Cantonese opera in China. I made a claim about how she made the Cantonese opera such an important performance 
uh, performing art in Shanghai, and such that she was compared to the Peking Opera performer Mei Lanfang during that time. And this is a, a go, goes to show how her record was actually, uh, you know, advertised in the newspaper. And this is actually a newspaper in uh, New York. This is not even in San Francisco. But you can see that uh, at a, oops, at the technology at that time was able to really, uh, you know, uh, print these records and she recorded a lot and they were selling really well. Another thing that is important to look at this advertisement is that you can tell it's a fashionable thing to do. So you have in here, you have these women, you know, portraying this kind of domestic uh, ideal of having this gramophone player as well as the perform performance. Here's a man and his name is Bai Zhirong. He's also extremely famous during that time. The, the opening is actually really interesting, the in introduction from the uh, instruments. <laughs> he was very much known for was that he lowered the singing to um, not so much high pitch or nasal. It actually lowered the whole singing, the, the, the production to a more, uh, they call it ping ho, and just more uh, um, like original uh, voice. And that is an important contribution that he had. Okay, so this goes to show lively performances in the 1920s, and here are just a quick sampling of some playbills. I'll tell you what they are. The one on the right hand top is the Portland, and you can see that they have a way to print these playbills. And then in the middle is, as we have seen already, the Le Manian, the one that came from actually Vancouver. And this one is uh, Guofonian, is the one that actually is performing in Honolulu. This Yong, Yong Shang is actually in, in, in New York, right? So, and this one, of course, is in San Francisco. And this is not everything yet. We still have uh, the, the ones in uh, Havana. We have the ones uh, in Boston that we can show. But they were very, very lively, and they were going all over the place. So if you can imagine this on the map, they go from one place and perform in the other place, and they bring their repertoire, and they're uh, doing a lot of fascinating, innovative kind of performances. And this then leads to the kind of amateur uh, club. This is an amateur club that's performed in Edmonton, Can Canada. As you can see, they are very elaborate and they also put together something that's really much, very much look like a professional. And this is a way for you to kind of appreciate how they were. And I'll show you a few more of uh, the, the production in the 1920s. And I want to add to say that companies opera, as well as the other Chinese opera genre, normally didn't have stage uh, backdrop like this. So this is a new thing, and I think it's related to the ways in which that they're in North America, right? And they want to have all sorts of different fancy things. And I think Shanghai probably adopts this as well, but not everywhere else. 
So this is another one that goes to show how they were lively performing the contemporary event. And this is a, the most bizarre one that I've found, which is that you have someone wearing tuxedo and you have someone wearing Ming Dynasty uh, dress, and they somehow make a story that makes this work. So one can only imagine what that story must be like. I, I can't. Uh, and they don't exist because they're playing from the plot line. And this is another one uh, that shows an elaborate setting. So some of these are actually stage prop, right? So this do two-dimensional uh, kind of backdrops. Okay, so those were in the 1920s. And then 1930, Melan Fang himself came to North America, as I mentioned, and he performed in Broadway. Uh, it was supposed to be three weeks and extended to five weeks because it was so lively. And then Macy, uh, the department store Macy, also named a flower after him. And he was just, this is a whole report in New York Times. So he was truly admired uh, during that visit. And this is the, his uh, uh, welcoming uh, photo, photo for his arrival in uh, San Francisco. And this is the mayor during that time and all the other people uh, showing how Chinese community really view Cantonese opera, I'm sorry, view Chinese opera as a way to help them establish their um, you know, prestige with the community. Okay, so up to the 1930s, Chinese theater was the primary performance element, right? Uh, so you go to the theater and you watch the performance, the live performance, the only thing. And in 1930s, you start to have sound, right? You have to have radio. So movie becomes something that be, uh, took people's attraction. And then theater that perform, you know, companies opera were not the only thing people get their enjoyment out of. So what did the Chinese performer do? Well, they start to make Chinese, um, make uh, Cantonese opera films. And this is actually a Grand View film company that was uh, established in San Francisco. And this is one of the, um, their movie. Uh, it's actually complicated. They established in San Francisco and went back to Hong Kong and then went back uh, uh, to San Francisco again after the war uh, started. But guess what the story is about? Can you make a good guess? You see the fashionable pair of people, right? And you also see the Chinese performers. It's a story about themselves. So it's a it's a story about Chinese theaters with struggling, uh, you know, to 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 compete with other things that society had to offer, right? So we are very lucky to be able to see a little bit of it. Then I, uh, I hope, yeah, I hope the sound will be good. Uh, I So this is a ritual they do in the backstage uh, for the deities for theaters. So you can tell the music is not what they perform in the theater. Okay, so that's all we got to see, only little clips. But these are theater uh, performers. So in newspaper, it actually talks about how these theater performers shoot the films, right, in the film set, and then 
changed their clothes and run across several street and to perform on stage uh, in uh, in a company's opera, right? So they do both. They do both to kind of you know uh, remain relevant to the community. But what happened when even this is not there anymore? What we have is the company's opera films, and people like this really were important household names for a lot of people who grew up in Chinatown in San Francisco. And one person, Tan Lanting, was actually a performer in North America. But when she was in North America, she played the uh, you know leading actress, uh, female role. And by the time she's performing in these films, she's playing a, a kind of comic role. You will see her playing the comic uh, middle-aged woman. <laughs> Opera film, but also has these, you know, uh, uh, kung fu films, and they were also very much, you know, performed by people who were interested, who were taken this acrobat in Cantonese opera to perform as a theater. So these became one of the important cultural, uh, uh, you know, um, production that was kind of shared by different community of Chinese all over North America. Right, because they have the film uh, production and they were uh, shown in various different cities. So I think basically in my book, what I wanted to show is that Cantonese opera and also the Chinese theaters were such an important part of Chinese communities. And today we uh, don't really get to learn a lot about them and why. Um, it is for many complicated reason, but I want to make a claim that the history is there for us to kind of explore and understand with this kind of full-hearted uh, kind of pursuit to see what it must be like for those people to be in the theater and enjoy the music, enjoy the sight, whether it's on the silver screen or whether it's on a, you know, um, a real person uh, performing. And we still have a lot of opportunity to understand uh, uh, what it means to have a Chinese theater in the community for all this time. So thank you very much for your time. This project is driven by my personal interest in navigating my cultural upbringing and my Chinese-Canadian identity. Here are some theaters and troops that I'll be talking about today. In particular, I aim to investigate and understand the role of Cantonese opera in Vancouver's Chinatown community during the 1920s. I argue that Cantonese opera and theater significantly contributed to the formation and sustaining of a thriving Vancouver Chinatown community during the decade. 
I'll begin my research by systematically reviewing a Chinese newspaper published in Vancouver titled The Chinese Times. It was published every day except for Sundays from 1914 to 1992 and documented Vancouver local news and entertainment, Canadian news and politics, Chinese and global news. My methodology is influenced by Dr. Nancy Rao's 2020 Li Xuefang meets Mei Lanfang article, where she closely examines a Shanghai newspaper titled Shenbao to trace two star opera performers meeting, Canty's opera's popularity in Shanghai, and similarities between the genres San Francisco and Shanghai migration. I use the same methodology to review the 1920s decade of Chinese times for investigating the Cantonese community's everyday experience in Vancouver and how Cantonese opera music played a central role in the establishment and development of a prosperous community. Reading Chinese Times was the most obvious choice for investigating this topic in its Vancouver context. Dr. Nancy Rao, for one, had already mentioned the newspaper in her 2017 book titled Chinatown Opera Theatre in North America, but to this day no one has reviewed this newspaper methodically and another re important reason is that the Chinese Times has recently been published and digitized by SFU systematically. So far, I've looked into eight years of the 1920s decade, from and including the year 1920 to 1927. I chose to review this decade precisely because this was the time period when the 1923 Chinese Immigration Act was proposed and passed. From the newspaper, we see that Vancouver's Chinatown community was very well organized self-sufficient, and financially comfortable during the 1920s. This is evidenced by the various advertisements posted by multiple Cantonese opera theaters, as well as numerous reports on the Vancouver Chinatown community supporting fellow Chinese communities elsewhere, including those in China, Honolulu, and Japan. We see a trend where theaters such as Singping Theater and Bogmanian Theater regularly posted advertisements using theater names, and from 1920, However, but from 1920 onwards, began to post advertisements using troops names, such as Dok Mangon Troop, as well as Gok Dong Hing Troop. Such shift in emphasis from location to performers indicate a heightened focus from on Cantonese Opera Performance Disassociation with particular locations and their mobility from one town to the next. There was often head-on competition between theaters as well. From September 8, 1921 to January 25th, 1922, for instance, both Singping Theatre and Bogmanian Theatre advertised side by side. Despite intense competition, however, theatres sometimes collaborated to further their charity efforts in helping Chinese communities. In January of 1922, for instance, Singping Theatre and Bogmanian Theatre cooperated to put on performances and raise funds for the operations of a public Chinese school in Vancouver. Indeed, we see many instances of Cantonese opera theaters supporting fellow Chinese communities on both a local and global scale. In February of 1923, for instance, Lokmanin Theater put on performances to raise funds for challenging a proposed law that aimed to segregate Caucasian and Chinese students in Vancouver and Victoria public education. In May of 1923 as well, Singping Theater organized performances to raise lawyer fees and support the Anti-Chinese Immigration Protest Committee in preventing the Chinese Immigration Act from being passed nationally. Despite the community's ultimate failure to stop the Laws Act enactment on July 1, 1923, Chinatown theaters continued to raise funds to confront various anti-Chinese and anti-Asian laws in subsequent years. We also see that the Chinatown Theater's charity efforts were not confined by national borders. There were numerous instances of theaters holding performances to support fellow Chinese communities outside of Canada. On September 28, 1923, for instance, Sok Manon Troop was raising funds for Chinese residents in the aftermath of a Japanese earthquake. In October of 1924 as well, Singping Theater put on performances for flooding relief in northern China. It is evident from the Chinese Times that Cantonese opera theaters in Vancouver and Victoria periodically put on performances not for profit but for the sole purpose of benefiting Chinese communities in Vancouver, Japan, and Mandarin-speaking northern China. Such kind of non-commercial, community-based performance significantly contributed to a sense of unity and solidarity both within and beyond the local Vancouver Chinatown community. Based on my evidence, Vancouver's Chinatown community was very well-structured, 
self-sustaining, and financially thriving. Unfortunately, union groups, along with the Canadian government, began to develop negative sentiments toward the Chinese during this decade. Seen as taking away Caucasian jobs, Chinese and Japanese in Canada in the 1920s encountered rampant discrimination and oppression in their everyday lives. One can clearly perceive the widespread racialized tension between Caucasians and Asians in British Columbia upon reading the early 1920s of Chinese, Chinese times. In particular, the former group felt uneasy and threatened, which developed into open animosity and structural racism upon realizing that the small Chinatown communities in Vancouver and Victoria have grown to be very resourceful. Resourceful enough to simultaneously sustain multiple Cantonese opera theaters and financially support the publishing of a daily newspaper, as well as actively mobilize to help local and transnational Chinese communities. Yet, the Cantonese community was not politically powerful enough to disrupt the implementation of the 1923 Chinese Immigration Act. My findings indicate that it was precisely because Chinese communities in Canada have become so self-sustainable, coordinated, and united that local Caucasian groups lobbied the Canadian government to pass anti-Asian immigration laws, such as the 1923 Chinese Immigration Act, also known as the Chinese Exclusion Act, to stop virtually all Chinese immigration. The point of my research is not to blame the Canadian government for their past racial prejudice or acts of racism, nor is it to absolve politicized unions such as the Import Customs Business Committee and Farmers Committee from historically oppressing and banishing minority groups. Rather, by showing that Chinese communities were flourishing despite such a long history of anti-Chinese racism in Canada. I argue that Chinese music and theaters played an indispensable role in Chinese community formation in British Columbia up during the 1920s. Ultimately, anti-Asian and anti-Chinese racism remains ongoing today. While the COVID-19 pandemic has magnified anti-Asian racial tensions in Canada and around the world, the Chinese Times reveals to us that racism has had a long history here in Vancouver. To this day, there continues to be stark differences between my immigrant family's everyday experience and my daily experience as a Chinese Canadian who is fluent in English. With this research, I hope to shine a new light on the Chinese community's resilience, strength, and unity both a century ago and today. At the end here, I would also like to thank and acknowledge all of those who have supported me during this research process. Thank you.